Well, good morning, family. Can we all just stand? Thank you, Tim. Lord, we come before you this morning, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that you've given us your Holy Spirit. Your word says that he is the Spirit of Truth. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will come. That you will reveal Jesus to us. That you will also come to reprove our hearts this morning. Of anything and everything that does not give glory to Jesus in our lives. Give us fear. Give us the holy fear of who God is in our hearts this morning. Make him real to us. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Touch every person standing here this morning. You say, Lord, that all you want is a contrite heart. And we are standing before you today, Lord. As you, you are the only one, Lord that holds it all together. And we give you the praise and the honour, Lord, that you saw it fit that we could be here another day in your presence, Lord. Another chance. Another chance, Lord. We praise you. We honour you this morning, Lord. Help us to fear you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you, family. You may sit down. So this morning, I want to talk to you about the one who holds it all together. Because a lot is happening in everybody's life at the moment. People are struggling. A lot of people have losses, problems, dealing with death. And a lot of people are at the point of giving up because it feels like they are drowning. People aren't coping anymore. And they run to us and they want to know why, who and what, they don't understand because life is not making sense to them anymore. And as you know, that's the best question you can ever ask a pastor. Because my only answer is Jesus and will always be Jesus. Pastor John, my marriage is falling apart. Jesus. My kids are sitting in the gutters. Jesus. Jesus. 
I can't tell you this morning that there is an easy way out. Because as we sit here this morning, we can vouch for the fact that he is the way and he is the truth and he's the only one that can give you life. And I promise you, if you put him first, you will forever have joy and peace, never mind what's falling apart around you. He is the only door that you can go through to a life of peace and joy in the midst of sorrow. He is our only hope, our only answer to all our questions. He's our only anchor. The Word of God tells us that we've got the hope. If you study it, it means we've got Jesus who is the anchor of our soul. What does anchor mean? Anchor means something that stabilizes and holds in place so that you can't slip backwards. For those who don't know what soul means, the Bible, when it talks about soul, it talks about your mind, your will, and emotions. So Jesus is the only anchor that's going to keep you sane in a world that is going completely mad. Time is not 24 hours anymore. I don't know if you've noticed that. Everything is sped up, and this is why people can't cope. I want us to look in Colossians 3.11. This is a verse that you should put up somewhere, because if you're going to continue and insist on living in sin, I want to start off by saying, if you die, you're going to hell. That's the gospel. You're living in deliberate sin, you die, you go to hell. The word of God tells us, he is all and he is in all. Read it again. He is all, and he is in all. Literally. Colossians 1.17 And he is before all things, and by him who is Jesus, all things consist. In other words, everything is made up of Jesus. If he had to give up, Nick, is this a problem? If Jesus had to let go, everything will fall apart. Because he is the one that holds every atom together. He is all and he is in all. He is the one who holds everything together. And if our lives and how we live is not Christ-centered, it will fall apart. Why? We've been created for him, through him, and by him. So we've been made the creation by a creator. And if that creator gives up on you, or you are not in his presence, your life falls apart. People come to us and they, they're hoping for this great formula. One word, Jesus. He is the only one that holds the power. The word tells us that he is sovereign. But we are so quick to call God out on that one, aren't we? We are so quick to turn to him and to say, you're in control, God. 
It's all your fault. Because the word says he's sovereign, doesn't it? No, it's not his fault. It is our fault. God has have, does not have control in our lives where we don't let him in. He will not and he shall not operate in our lives if we shut him out. It's not his fault. Then we get to him and we ask him, if you are sovereign, how can you allow these things in my life? He didn't. We did. We allow our will, our desire to be in the world and to choose rather the world, to go to the world and to Jesus. Our will overrides his. And God will not force him in where he's not welcome. Jesus is not considered until a crisis hits. How come when a crisis hits, your spirit and your heart knows where to run? How come when a crisis hits, your spirit knows that he is sovereign over life and death? Because it's the only time that your spirit cannot deny who your creator is. Why does it have to take this before we turn to them? And, and when we turn to him, we turn to him with all these questions that are actually accusing him of his absence in our situation. In a court of law, it will be a case that is thrown out because you cannot have a criminal case against somebody that wasn't even present at the crime scene. How can we accuse him of his absence if we didn't let him in to start off with? Can you start to see the picture? The word says he's all and in all. So just reading that he is all and he is in all, it means that Jesus shouldn't just be a part of our day, a part of our hour. He should be everything in our lives. But the minute something happens in our life, we run to him and say, where were you? But we never opened the door, we never invited him in. If he is all in all, how can we expect him then to be a part of our life and when things go wrong we want all of him? We won't even deal in our own lives with relationships that would ask that of us. Somebody that calls, just calls you when they need something. But when something goes wrong, we call on him and we want everything. We want answers, we want it fixed. And some of us wait until we have to say goodbye to somebody that died. We need to realize that the word of God is compiled from statements, not suggestions. When it says he is all and in all, it's a fact. It's the truth. The young people would say, it is what it is. It is what it is. He is all and he's supposed to be in all. He's not supposed to be just a part of our day. He is the only one that holds it together and we dare choose and obey a world that is busy decaying and dying. Come on, people. The, word, the world has shown e each and every one of us already that we cannot rely on it.
But we are like, the Bible say, we are like a dog that goes back to its vomit every freaking time. Sorry, I mustn't say freaking. I, get, I just get so angry. Jesus. Why am I lacking? Jesus. Why am I struggling? Jesus, because he's not all in all in our lives. And this is why we fail. We fail because we do not allow him to be all in our lives and to be all in all areas of our lives. I'm telling you this morning. If you're going to insist on living with deliberate sin in your life, then I can guarantee you, you can start preparing your life for more hardships, more heartache, more death around you. Because I'm telling you this morning, nothing will work outside of his will and outside of Jesus. He is the one that keeps your life together. It's his mercy that keeps us together in times when we don't even turn to him. He cannot and will not be just part of our lives because he cannot be who he isn't. He is all and in all. And if you live a life where you think he's going to change his word for you, there are Bible scholars, God cannot change his word. His word is placed above his own name and it says it will last forever till eternity. So you're going to still read that word when you're in heaven one day. But we want God to change because God will most understand. I always use marriage. When you are married, you can't just live your marriage in part. Well, there's a, there are a few dead devils that are trying. But your marriage will suffer death. You can't love Jesus, but just live him in, in love him in part. And then we have the wonderful world that brainwashes people by saying, you're a free spirit. You can choose what you want. And I agree with that last one. You can choose what you want, indeed. But it's what comes next that you don't want, which is consequences. Lack comes. Sickness comes. Death comes, addictions comes, and it wraps you up in chains so tightly that you cannot get loose. Bondage to this world, because it's not your all in all. I always say every little space that you don't fall with Jesus, Satan will fall for you. You can't just have voids in your life. He is all in all. He's either there or he's not. The result of living like that, if that's your choice, is that not just you will suffer, but your kids as well. We deal with so many selfish parents that are so focused on what they want hurt that I don't want to lay down because that person owes me. Do you know that your life and that of your kids is a sum total of your choices? And it will be carried over to the next generation. We're going to look at that just now. So if we want to fix our mess, we need to understand there is no other choice. Please hear me this morning. It's either all of him in your house in your heart and in every area of your life 
or you will die. You will die. And then we have churches that mislead people, that preaches the God of love without consequences. God of love, such a beautiful statement, but it's become like a, like a one-sided slogan that is used. Don't worry, he's a God of love. <laughs> The Bible does say that it rains on the just and on the unjust. God loves the righteous and he loves the unrighteous. And it says that he's the, the lover of my soul. But who he is in his fullness, you cannot separate. And this is what the world is trying to do with their feel-good um, sermons. They're trying to separate the fact that God is merciful from the fact that he's also a judge. And that the two go hand in hand because he loves you so much he cannot let you continue in sin. The truth is he's an infinite God, he's a God of infinite mercy and infinite justice. He's a lover of our souls, but he's also a just God that has to punish our sins. Parents would understand. I love my kids. But because I love them, I cannot let them live in sin or in this world. I will not. I will discipline them. What's different to our loving father, except that he's got more patience than we do as parents. He loves you. He loves you. He died for you. Who are you to say, sorry Lord, I don't want to lay this down, because it's too much to ask. He loves you. He disciplines us because his word tells us. Like I said to the students the other day, in the Bible, God gives you the problem. He warns you about the problem and he gives you the answer. But we don't read his word. He's a God of infinite mercy and infinite justice. Because he loves you and his word warns you that if you do not repent of your sin, it will be carried over to the next generation. We need to understand when we read the word of God tells us that our choices will influence our kids, whether it's positive or whether it's negative. I want us to look at Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7, and you're going to see verse 6 and a half of 7 describes the God of infinite mercy. And then the last bit tells you he's a God of justice and he will not stand for deliberate sin or any sin in our lives. So it starts off where God appeared to Moses and where God describes himself it says the Lord proclaimed the Lord the Lord God compassionate and gracious slow to anger and abounding in love and kindness and truth and faithfulness keeping mercy and loving kindness for thousands of generations forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin but, and this is where his judgment, judgment comes in, he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting, in other words, avenging the iniquity, sin and guilt of the fathers, what you and me do, 
and not repent of upon the children and the grandchildren to the third and the fourth generation. That is calling the children to account for the sins of the fathers. I almost want to say 99% of people that we deal with that have problems is because of the fathers, the sins of the fathers. When we started sorting out our lives, the things that was dug up was ugly. Things that we didn't ask for. You know, you've got a choice. You can either carry on blaming your parents for what is wrong in your life, or you can stand up and say, it ends here. My kids will not suffer in this manner. We will live for Jesus. Do you really think that premature death and cancer, sicknesses, ailments, divorce, do you think it's just a coincidence that that's in your family line? He will w visit the iniquity and sin of the fathers upon the children and the grandchildren to the third and the fourth generation. And he will call the children to account for the sins of the fathers. Why do we have all of this in our lives? The lack of Jesus. We've got ourselves to blame. And then we fail, and I need you to hear me out on this one until I'm done. Then we fail and we fall short because we want to claim what is not ours. We've just established in Exodus 34 but God loves us. And prior to that, we established that he loves all. Reign on the just and the unjust. Then we saw in verse 7, that is a just God that will not leave sin unpunished, right? But now there's a third thing that does not get preached. I don't want to say any more because I rarely ever hear this. That Bible, as you are holding it, with all its promises and blessings and healing, is not for all. It is only for those who love God. That's what the Word says. We've got to make the, I added this one in. In Romans 8, verse 28, there's a verse that says, We know that all things will work together, right? And how many people do you hear quoting that? And they still fail. Why? Because they don't finish reading. For those who love him. Because it carries on saying that he predestined us to become like his son. God's promises are for those who love him, who lives for him, and obey him. And I know I'm crapping a lot of people today, but the fact is the fact, that's what the word says. I actually want to dare you from now on, when you read your Bible, and there's a promise, and the word love is there, encircle it, because it's going to tell you it's for my people, it's for my redeemed, it's for those who live holy, it is for those who live like my children, who are led by the Spirit, are called sons of God. It is not to be used loosely, on these lips when you are not living for God. That's why we fail. That's why people would say, but I declared this. I did this. Doesn't your God say that, you know what, all I have to do is use the name of Jesus for those who love him. And it's hard for people to swallow today's day because we live in this chaotic, crazy, rebellious world that teaches you that it's okay, you can take what's not yours. You've got the right to whatever you did not earn or worked for. 
And if it's your choice to stay on that side of the fence or to sit on the fence, I'm telling you now, you cannot feed from your neighbor. You cannot feed from the anointing and the harvest of your neighbor. You've got to earn it yourself by loving him, by living right. This is why things fail in life, our prayers, things that we ask of God, because he's all, and he's supposed to be all in all. Matthew 12, 30 says, and this is where the fence comes in, you cannot sit on the fence. You cannot be in the world and then run to God. And when you are helped and feeling better, whoops, off you go again. God says the one that is not for him is against him. No middle path. No middle path. You're either 100% with him or you're not. Or you are against him. The Bible says those promises are for those who love him. So when I say for those who love him, I can easily tell you it's for those who love and live for him and obey him, but the word needs to speak for itself. I want us to look at John 14, 21. It says, the person who has my commandments and keeps them, that is the one who really loves me. I'm going to read it again. The person who has my commandments and keep them, that is the person who really loves me. So in your heart, I want you to answer that verse. Do you have a Bible? Do you come to church? Are you in Bible college? Because then you have his commandments. Now I want to, uh, you to ask, uh, answer yourself. How much of that do you keep? Do you keep those commandments that he's given you? Now I shouldn't be putting the word in how much of that are you keeping? Are you keeping God's commandments? Because he says the one who has my commandments and keep them is the one who really loves me. So love equals for God. When he says those who love me, it equals those who walk in obedience. Who does his word, not knows his word, that does his word and lives holy. As we read the Bible, we also read about God keeping his covenant, his promises. It's the same thing. But covenant sometimes goes over people's heads. What is a covenant? A covenant means a contract, an agreement, and a agreement between God and his people, his people, in which God makes promises to his people but it requires a certain conduct from the other party. In other words, to live holy, to have access to the covenant promises. Does that make sense? So when we read verses on healing, it is part of the covenant. If we read verses on prosperity, it's part of the covenant. You need to understand, on the cross he died for us, and everything he obtained and had the victory over on the cross is for everyone, but cannot be possessed by everyone, unless you turn to Jesus. For the unbelievers, it's there but they cannot draw from it because he's not all in all in their life. And I want to show you in Deuteronomy 7, 9 and 12. It says, Understand therefore that the Lord your God is indeed God. 
He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant, in other words, all his promises, for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on who? Those who love him and obey his commandments. If you listen to these regulations and faithfully obey them, the Lord your God will keep his covenant of unfailing love with you as he promised with an oath to your ancestors. If you go read that whole part, we see that within that covenant, the bless after the, the um, promises of God is love and protection. And it says he will destroy your enemies. It is so ironic that we run from everything that we always wanted. Because the world, we think, is no effort. So the Bible states that these promises are not for the wicked. Who is the wicked? The wicked are those who ignore God's commandments and carry on living their way their life. Those who sit here Sunday after Sunday and walk out back to deliberate sin. Proverbs 3.33 The curse of the Lord is in and on the house of the wicked. But he declares, blessed, joyful and favoured with blessings, the home of the just and the consistently righteous. Consistently righteous. I'm trying to paint a picture this morning that God is not a slot machine. That things in our life goes wrong because he's not in it to start off with. And I need you to get this this morning. You've got to live consistently righteous and holy. Consistently. Consistently. A lifestyle. But now I'm going to clap even further. That was his promises. What about our prayer life? Does he hear everybody's prayer? I promise you, this hit me so hard. When I started studying this. Proverbs 15, 29 in the Amplified, it says, The Lord is far from the wicked. Remember we said, as those who ignore his commandments, ignore who he is. The Lord is far from the wicked and distances himself from them. But he hears the prayer of the constantly righteous, that is, those with spiritual integrity and moral courage. Moral courage means to serve and not fearing the cost of serving him. How many people, quote that you know, the word of God says, ask what you want and God will give you the desires of your heart. It's taken out of context if you're not loving God and living for him. That's why it doesn't work. Because the world teaches God of love. Claw. Now you come and you quote, God says, I can ask what I want, and he'll give me my heart's desires, but I'm seeing nothing. What happens? Satan starts talking in your ear. Why are you serving a God that doesn't even love you, that doesn't even live up to his word? Why? Because you don't live a holy life, and you do not serve him with everything in your life. Doesn't I exclude us as pastors 
we've still got a lot of faults in our lives. Also because the flesh takes over and by the time we get to a problem, we realize I never asked God's permission for this. We also make mistakes, so I'm not standing here this morning looking down on you. I am sharing a message that God has shared to my heart. We can't say he won't give you the desires of your heart if you are not. Your heart is not his. It's almost like sometimes living with a teenager in the house. You know they're there, but they're never there. That's not a relationship that God wants. Please, we need to get it this morning while we need more of Jesus, not more of him all. People want to come to church and then after the first service, turn a little bit, the whole time, the whole time. And then in the interim, things happen and it pushes you back. What is holding you back from giving your all? Your pride. You want to finish that situation or that whatever's in your life that you feel you've got the rights to hold on to. You want to be angry. You want to be the victim. A lot of people are hard of spiritual hearing. And they choose to stay in the desert of their life. It's by choice. Sometimes God will allow us to experience the harshness of a desert so that we can become desperate for his living water and the bread of life. Read with me, turn to Deuteronomy 8. I want to read verse 1 to 3 there. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe. Why? So that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. Why do we need to obey? So that we can live, we can multiply, we can go in and that's where we stop. Because most of us cannot go further and possess what God has given us in the promised land. Because we want to live a life of disobedience in deliberate sin. Verse 2, and you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. Why? To humble you, to test you, and listen to this, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Every wilderness that we go into has a purpose. The word tells us it is to humble you, to test you, and so that God can know your heart if you are willing to follow his commandments. It is our choice if we're going to decide if we want to graduate from our wilderness and turn or be like the, the Israelites that turn 11 day journey into 40 years. 40 years, a lifetime. Verse 3, so he humbled you, allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, jump a line, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. It's a statement not a suggestion. It tells you, God gives you the answer. It says, man shall not be able to live off this world. You need the living word in you. So why do we fail? 
Why do we have losses? Why doesn't life not, why doesn't it make sense? Because we are trying to live off the world. After God told us, you shall not be able to. And we want to get angry at God? We need the one that is life. Remember the manner that was offered to the Israelites was Jesus to come. Our bread of life. And if you're going to continue to refuse all of him, you will die. Romans says to us in 8 verse 13, Nick is not there. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. There is no life. Your body, my husband hates it when I say that. As you are born, you are busy dying. Ever thought of that? When God says you shall not, it's a spiritual law, just like gravity, just like aging, and yes, we can slow it down. There's so many rumpies, and I don't know what mess all is on the market today, but you can't stop it. It's a natural law. You can't stop every word of God. It's living. So how do I make this right? If we say that the word of God and the promises are not for all, and if the word of God shows us that God only hears the prayers of the consistently righteous, How do I make this right? And I want to give you four things this morning. Firstly, you, make, you have to make a deliberate decision to put your old life behind you. If you're lukewarm, to put those sins behind you. But it's got to be a deliberate decision. And I'm telling you again what the gospel says. If you are living with unrepented sin, willingly knowing it is sin, you die, you go to hell. And I will keep on saying that. Because people are too scared to preach the plain gospel out of the Bible the way it is stated. Because we don't want to offend. You've got to make a deliberate decision. Acts 3, 19 says, so turn away from your sins. Turn to God, then your sins will be wiped away. And look how beautiful this is. And the time will come when the Lord will make everything new. That broken heart, that body of yours that is riddled by cancer, he makes everything new. That heaviness that you are carrying, not yours anymore. The second thing that you need to do, just call on him. Just call on him. Because the Bible says, although it says he hears the prayers of those who constantly live righteous and love him, it also tells us he will never turn away anybody that calls on him in truth. So yes, he's a God of infinite justice. But he's a God of infinite mercy. Psalm 145, 18 to 20 tells us, The Lord is near to all who call on him. To all who call on him in truth. It means without deception, not just Lord, I need you now, but not tomorrow. Because remember your step one was to step away from your deliberate sin and to make a deliberate decision. Now you can call on him and he will hear you. 
He will fulfill then the desire of those who fear and worship him. Can you see from calling on him, you've got to go through reverent fear and worshiping him. So you can't just call on him and turn away and run back to the world. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear and worship him with awe-inspired reverence and obedience. He also will hear their cry and he will save them. The Lord keeps, here we go again, all who loves him, but all the wicked he will destroy. Never mind what your life looks like. If you've put away that sin and turn to him and call on him he will never turn you away never point number three you need to learn to come into his presence but you need to learn to stay there you can't come in take what you want and leave <coughs> The other day, Pastor Chris laughed at me because he always laughed at the, the pictures that God gives me because I said the other day to him, I said I was using my checkers card and I said to him, this looks like a pastor. People come to us when they're in trouble and they go like, can I have your checkers card, which is Jesus. Swipe it quickly, get what they want and off they go again. Back to the same problem. You've got to make a decision to come into his presence and to stay. Psalm 91, and do not close your religious ears to this one, please. Hear me out. It says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall remain stable, shall remain fixed, under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe, which uh, means enemy, can withstand. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, dwells means to go there and to settle, to stay, not to move from that place. That person will remain stable and fixed. Why? Because you're under the protection and the shadow of the Almighty. And then people want to read the rest of Psalm 91. A thousand shall uh, fall by my side, ten thousand all around me, but the enemy will not come near me. Or you will say that the pestilence shall not come near my dwelling. Go read it again and again and again. It keeps on saying, those who dwell with me. Those who are in the secret place of the Most High. It's not when you're out there. It's when you decide to dwell, to come in and to settle in the secret place of the Most High. And you stay there. That's where the protection is. That's where long life is. That is where the angels will lift you up and not even your toe will stump on a, on a stone. It is not in your daily life and running around, seeing danger coming, go like, pestilence shall not come near me. When you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, you are filled with the Spirit of God. That's when you can walk out there and say, no pestilence shall come near my house. But how many times do we utter those words in the flesh because it's knowledge? But we haven't even spent one minute in that day with God. You can't give out what you're not filled up with. So in that presence, when you choose to go into his presence and to stay there, to stay filled up, you will be led by the Spirit, you will be filled with the Spirit, and whatever's in you then will spill out to others. And that's when we touch people and they are healed. The last point is, we've got to focus on Jesus if we want to win the war against sin and the flesh. So you've got to make a deliberate decision to turn your whole life around. 
You've got to call on him and he will answer you. Then you've got to choose to come into his presence and say, this is where I am going to stay. And now the war starts against your flesh. And the only way is to look at Jesus and nothing else. Galatians 5.17 tells us, all your answers are in the word of God. Your problems, your answers, and your warnings. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And that is in capital, that's the spirit of God. And the spirit, the Holy Spirit, gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free, listen to this, to carry out your good intentions. You cannot fight your flesh. You cannot say no to porn or alcohol by yourself. And if you want to say to me, Pastor John, this is too much. You're right, it is too much. You cannot do this by yourself. That's why you've got to dwell with him under his protection, filled with his spirit, because it's supernatural, this war that we are fighting. People get so fixated on the alcohol that's calling their name. That they don't even see Jesus around them. Think about it. If you have two plants and you only water the one, the other one's going to die, right? So ignore your sin. Not ignore like and don't repent. Stop fixating on what you, the battle that you cannot win on your own. Turn to Jesus. The more time you spend with him, the more you're going to become like him, the more your habits are going to die down because you will have no desire. How many people always pray, give me a desire for you, Lord? How does my husband desire me? He sees me and he spends time with me. You cannot desire what you haven't tasted and what you haven't touched and what you don't spend time with. Stop asking God to do it for you. You are not going to have a desire to read the Bible if you don't open the word of God and allow Jesus to touch you. Does not work like five minute noodles. And my kids seem to think that five minute noodles can be cooked without water and set the house alight. Joshua, we need the water. We need the living water. My husband is canning himself because he always laughs. These are the pictures that God gives me and I will utter them. <laughs> so the more time you spend with him, the less you're going to want to do these things. So I read to you just now Romans 8.13 and I want to read the whole verse to you. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die, right? We read that. But if you live by the Spirit, when you dwell in His presence, if you live by the Spirit, then you will put to death the deeds of the body and you will live. That's why people fight addiction and they cannot conquer it. Because the attention is on the devil and not on the Jesus that can come inside of you with his spirit and heal those addictions. Because the minute we dwell in the secret place, we become stable and fixed, get filled with the spirit and demons have got to flee. And I'm closing, I'm not going to call her, keep you here the whole Sunday. I hope with this message you can understand that we have no right to question God. Or things that goes wrong. 
And I promise you, I've, we've, we've lived those days where things have died, people have died, we've lost stuff. <coughs> that if I have to admit that it was my fault, I would have had to deal with me and I had that split second to accuse God. So we know what it feels like. But you cannot be angry at him if he is not your all in your life. Show me one, one um, passage or sentence in the Bible that hides promises from God, that hides warnings, that doesn't tell us that there will be death. We just haven't. We get angry when people die around us. We can't stand in, in for them. And this is harsh facts. We can't stand in for them and where Jesus is concerned if they kept on refusing Jesus. The Bible tells us there's going to be death. Why do we get angry? He just didn't say when. The Bible doesn't hide from us that there's going to be hard times, that people are going to disappoint and hurt you. None of that is hidden. It's, it's, it's in broad daylight, in front of us, but we choose not to read that word. And like I said earlier, you've got the right indeed to choose if you want to stay angry. If you want to hold God accountable for what's happening in your life. But you're the only one that's going to suffer. It's time to take up that mirror and say, I am the cause of what is happening in my life. Do you want your kids to suffer the same struggles? Is it worth it? Is it worth it blaming a God that was not even at the crime scene? No, it isn't. Because then you are not in that word, those who love me. Jesus is the only hope that we have. The only supernatural power that can fight and protect us against what is happening and what is still coming. A lot of people are asking, things are getting bad, what am I to do? Keep yourself at his feet and your kids and they will be fine. God promises to protect those who love him. God is sovereign. He is the one that holds it all together. He is our hiding place and our rock. He is the one and only. It's the most beautiful verse in Psalm, I can't remember which Psalm, is somewhere in the 30s or 80s, that says that He is my defense, the Holy One of Israel is my King. But only those who love Him can say that. So many beautiful verses and we, some of us can't even use it because we are not allowing him to be all in all areas of our lives. Every area where we shut him out, we are rejecting him. And what does the Bible say? If you deny me in front of men, I will deny you in front of my father. If there's an area in your life where you refuse to let Jesus in, whether it be you just choose to live like that or because you're worried about other people, you are rejecting the one and only that holds everything together and he will reject you in front of the Father. There's a quote that says, when Jesus becomes more real to you than your situation or your sickness or your brokenness, then your situation has to bow its knee. I need you to think about it. Jesus can't become real to you 
while you're sitting in the traffic or screaming at people or while you're at, in, at work. He becomes real in the secret place of the Most High. So your answers as to who and why and what is Jesus. Why do things go wrong? Jesus is not your all in all. And as I said, I'm standing here just as guilty as any of you to this morning. And he will keep on humbling us and he will keep on testing your heart until he knows that you can follow through with his commandments and then you will get the inheritance of those who love him. Let's close our eyes. Lord, thank you for your living word. Thank you, Lord, that nothing, Lord, can come against it. I thank you, Lord, as your truth was spoken this morning, Lord, and that it will not return unto you void, Lord, because it is living. It is Jesus. And every demon that is hiding will have to flee where Jesus enters. And Holy Spirit, I ask right now that you will help us to renounce our old life, that we can call on you, and that we can enter into the secret place of the Most High. Help us to spend time with you. So that we can, Lord, start desiring who you are. Forgive us, Lord. As a pastor of this church, Lord, I stand here on, on behalf of my family, Lord. I repent of all the areas, Lord, where we have pushed you out. And I thank you, Lord, that immediately your word says it's taken away from us. Never to be frowned upon, never to remember again. Our sin is gone. And we call upon you this morning, Lord. And we know that you hear us, Lord, those who call upon you in truth. Help us, Lord, to lay our bodies as a living sacrifice on you, our altar, Lord. Burn up in us, Lord, everything that should not be there, Lord. Convict our hearts this morning, Lord, of everything that does not give you glory. It's got to go. It has to go. It has to go. Thank you, Lord, for loving us that much. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so much, Lord, that you correct us, that you chastise us, Lord. That you love us as a father and curse you, Satan, for bringing lies into our minds. We serve a God of infinite mercy and infinite justice. And he shall be all in all and all in our lives in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord, that nothing stops your word. Nothing stops your spirit. Nothing can come against the God Almighty. And we praise you this morning. In Jesus' mighty name.
Amen.